All right, we are now recording. <laughs> uh, Sam's got bird poop Someone. all over this windshield. <laughs> so we're heading down to uh, Riot Games' office in Clayton. Yes. We're going to talk about game jams. Jamming. Jamming games. And we uh, are going to basically improv the talk. Is that would do things. We're in pro this video as well. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, everything about you this. See, is I have no script in my hands. Nowhere. Nowhere. So this is unplanned. Uh, we were asked by the St. Louis Game Dev community to uh, just come and talk to everybody about what it means to uh, make games in a weekend mm -hmm. and why and how and stuff like that. So make sure you get a really good shot on that. All that bird shit. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really just. Honing in. Killing it. How about a little wiper fluid? How about <laughs> we give it a score? Scotch. Okay, cool. Uh, thank you for coming to this Q and A with the Butterscotch Shenanigans for their upcoming Shenana Jam event. Uh, sounds like you all actually had a lot prepared, so don't need to do as much for an intro. But we have <laughs> Sam Coster and Seth, as you guessed, also a Coster. And Adam Coster in here in spirit. So uh, please welcome. He didn't them. die. He just <laughs> yeah. didn't mean it that way. Everybody, uh, so thanks so much for coming. Uh, we're super excited to be here. Jamming is one of our favorite things, basically in the world, as far as activities to do. So we're happy to be able to come and share a little bit of the jam with all of you guys tonight. And so a big stuff. What we wanted to cover uh, was sort of you know, why you might actually jam in the first place. So what's the point? Why would you spend a whole weekend doing this? Uh, and then following up with that, how you might go about jamming to sort of maximize your experience overall. Uh, so first things first, I just want to touch on why. So you're all here, which is a good first step, but why even do this thing over the weekend? Uh, why even consider the option of doing this thing over the weekend? Um, it's a big, crazy event, and it will take a bit out of you because for most of us, we can put our lives on hold while we uh, you know, go into a cave and make a game for two days. So why do you think it is that, uh, that people do game jams generally? Have any ideas? How many people have done one? Okay. Okay. All right. We've got a few uh, newcomers. Half inch. So what do you? What have we gotten from a game jam? Practice. Practice. Experience. Some experience. It's a Fatigue. Like <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, for me, because a lot of times I can't like during other normal life, I can't always make the time for it, and so it's really easy to be like this weekend I'm spending on this time. Right. So, so it's like a compressed, time. structured yeah. thing. Yeah. Friends. Friends, those are good. Enemies, perhaps. Enemies also. Keeps life interesting. Getting started on a project. So getting depression. So getting some momentum going. Finishing having a deadline. Yes. Basically having an artificial deadline that essentially there's a community waiting on you to get your stuff done, which is kind of nice. New tech. New tech. Yes. Cool. So um, we started off jamming in 20, I guess 10 was my first one. 2011 was mine. And then together, we made a game in 2012, uh, which is called Tau Five of the Gods. And this is sort of the first game that we had made, um, I guess the second game we made as a team, I believe. Yes. And first game as a two-person team. Yeah, yeah, just the two of us. And uh, after this game, which you'll see is not very good, uh, we decided to go full-time at this whole thing called Game Dev. I could bore you for two more minutes, but I won't. So, the uh, <laughs> point is that we had, uh, you know, this is our first time making a game uh, just as a two person team. I was doing all the art, and I actually wasn't an artist by any sort of uh, trade or training. And so, uh, you can see most things are just circles with some, maybe some limbs poking off. Uh, and in Seth's case, a lot of this was, uh, a, was it a mixture of drag and drop and code at this yeah, point? Yeah, some drag and drop, some code. We had never done a top-down kind of a game like this before, so there's a lot of discovery in that area. Um, we also had a big problem, like, how do you get this much blood on the screen? Very that was a big technical you need problem. need to know how to do <laughs> so By the time you get to the end, it's just red. Everything is red, right? Um, Learned a lot about sort of managing larger games because we had so many enemies on screen that by the time we were about to submit it, we had a memory overflow and the game would just crash before you could beat it. So uh, learned all kinds of stuff. It was the first time we made a mini map. Um, and so all these kinds of 
fun little little tricks that we got to then sort of pull forward into uh, into future projects. So a big part of where, why we do uh, game jams nowadays is for the tech side of things, and also just to get ideas and kind of you know just flex a bit because we found that even though we do this full time for our jobs, you know we we tend to work like a sort of a steady eight to six seven ish depending on the day, um, and then you know take breaks in the weekends and everything else, and so it's a nice way to just kind of essentially get a really huge bolt of inspiration, get some momentum going, and kind of pick up uh, some creative energies over just a really short period of time that we can then pull into our next game project. So uh, over the course of the last, I guess, six years, uh, we've done a ton of jams, um, and all of them are listed on our, on our uh, YouTube channel. You can see the playlist of all of our previous game jams, and you can also play a bunch of them thanks to Itch. Uh, we host a bunch of them up there, so you can download them and check them out. And what you'll notice is that most of them are very medium in terms of you know the overall like delivery at the end of the day they're not sort of you know commercial quality we can't we can't release them as is right, right? and we used to we actually did that for a while uh, we would make a game on monday and then uh, release it monday night so we it was an eight hour game jam um, we did that for four weeks in a row and then we realized that no one cares when you make a game that fast uh, there's just nothing super interesting that can possibly happen in that short time and also people's attention kind of burns out so the big question is uh, that I want to talk about is just sort of what are the best practices for getting the most out of your 48 hours and uh, trying to get you know some of that new tech, trying to maybe make some friends and trying to have a really good time, uh, get a lot out of the event and that sort of thing. So the first thing I want to talk, I want to touch on um, is team size and composition. So Seth, do you want to yes. take it away? So just like in a good MMO, you know you need a tank, a DPS, and a healer, right? So you need people with appropriate roles for your team. Uh, who are able to contribute in a meaningful way depending on what your constraints are and what your goals are. Uh, what we found is there are a lot of people in game jams who maybe have never programmed before, never done art, never done music, and they're afraid. And so they say, I'm just an idea person. I'm a designer. It's my job to just kind of give everybody else work to do. Uh, it turns out that this isn't as helpful as you might think because in a jam context, what we found is that Every minute that we spend brainstorming adds about an hour of work. Uh, and so in the very beginning, you know, we, we hit the 45 minute mark, we're done, that's it. And so if you have a designer uh, who is every hour, just the entire 48 hours thinking of new ideas, uh, that person's gonna go home kind of disappointed because almost none of their ideas will get to make it into the game. Uh, they will be able to do things like testing and QA and stuff like that, but it's far more effective to have somebody who's actually creating assets and creating stuff to put into the game, creating code and that kind of stuff. So uh, if you're one of those people who you were like, I'm just gonna come in and just be a designer, uh, just just pick up Game Maker or Unity or something and just start playing around with tutorials. You know, there's a few days until the jam. And actually in Sam's first jam, he was not a programmer. He picked up Game Maker two days beforehand, did the tutorials for drag and drop and ended up making a, a fairly, uh, crude, playable, <laughs> top-down shooter. Right? And so a big point of the jam is to kind of push yourself in domains where you would otherwise not really be comfortable. And you want to kind of think about it like how, you know, how little kids are never afraid to fail at things. They fall over, they just babble and make incoherent words that don't make any sense. Uh, and when you're first starting out with making your own games, that's how you're going to be too, and you have to be okay with that because a jam is just a, it's a throwaway thing, right? So you're going to make it, you're going to learn all kinds of stuff, and then you can move on to some real stuff afterwards. Yeah, and a big part of the team comp thing is essentially boiling it down to the simple rule that everybody who's on your team should build something that goes into the game. Uh, and it, this is, and it be built in a technical sense, whether that's putting some art together, uh, going and hunting down fonts that you're going to need, uh, hunting down music that you're going to need, or building music, all this sort of stuff. Uh, make sure that everybody has a particular thing to do that they actually that actually gets put in the game, not just ideas. Otherwise, you tend to kind of float around quite a bit. Um, and on top of that, there is a bit of a need for essentially what is called production. So someone who says, it's 6 o'clock on Saturday night, we have you know, one day left, what can we get done, what needs to be cut, uh, who's going to who's gonna get the upload ready, that sort of thing. Uh, so make sure you designate at least one person to be the person who's at least vaguely in charge of that stuff. There's not a lot of it to do. There's probably like 30 to 40 minutes of that total over the whole weekend. But a lot of teams, uh, if they don't designate your point person, who's like, okay, I'll take care of making sure we have all of our stuff together for the upload, which includes some screenshots and text and sorts of stuff like that, you will sort of get bitten by it at the last hour, which is not the right time for anybody to have a surprise amount of work to do. Yeah, so our general rule of thumb is to make Sam do all that stuff. 
uh, because he's the artist, and uh, we can we can sort of more easily meter out and figure out how much art we're going to need. And if we have an animation that's getting too complex, we can say, "Ah, just cut a bunch of frames." Right. When it comes to the programming side of things, either it works or it doesn't. And if it doesn't work, we got to keep putting time into it until it does. And so programming is much harder to, to sort of cut time out. So if, you, if you're going to take a programmer off and put them onto typing up your description or something, or creating your uh, YouTube video, you might have a bit of a harder time getting your game finished. So having your, having your artist do that kind of stuff is a pretty good way to do this we found. Um, next we're going to talk about briefly is how to do design discussions. So uh, we've had people come and jam in our offices before, and this is one of the questions they usually ask before they get there, which is how do you guys come up with these the sort of wacky ideas that you end up executing on over the weekend. Because a lot of people just already hit some weird sort of uh, hard phase right at the beginning of the gym. And so uh, for those, again, who are, who are new initiates, what will happen is you'll get a theme, and then there'll be a couple of using modifiers that you can choose to slap on there as well. Things like a limited color palette or very particular weird controls and that sort of thing. So what we do is we literally uh, essentially have like an improv session. So we take the theme idea in, and then uh, by virtue of essentially saying yes and to whatever ideas start coming out for about five minutes, we come up with a game idea. So what this tends to look like is uh, we actually have a podcast coming out on Friday, which you'll, you'll actually hear this happen in the podcast. Uh, and the whole point is just to be really, really loose and not shut down ideas that you're, that your uh, other teammates have right from the get-go. This is not the point where you're like cutting the stuff already. What you're trying to do is just sort of ferret out enough ideas that maybe one of them sticks out as being something that might be a good thing for your team to seize on and go do. And usually you can kind of feel it, you can kind of feel it out in a group setting, you know, a bunch of ideas will come out. And as long as you're not the sort of person who's like, my idea is gold and it must be the thing we make, which you should not be that person if you're coming to the game jam, uh, then you then the, the team comp tends to work, work itself out, a game tends to be found. And what we found is that a lot of teams will spend like two to four hours on this, which is which is mayhem. Way like too it's long. just way <laughs> too long. Uh, as soon as you have the vaguest idea of what's going to happen, uh, you need to start going. So what I want to show with this is a game we made uh, for the last Scatter Jam 2016 that we went to, which is called Betty the Yeti. So this game started off well. Betty the Yeti's yachting adventure, extreme investment banking. Yeah, it has some investment <laughs> mechanics in it uh, about accruing investments as you come up a map. So the original idea, I don't remember what, do you remember what the theme was? I don't remember what the theme was, but the... Open yeah. to interpretation, I think, was the theme. Open yeah. to interpretation? Yes, yes. yes. Which, is, which is a bit vague. But <laughs> there, were some, there were some super good modifiers, including one about global warming. Um, yes. And so we somehow ended up on the idea of, of uphill skiing. I don't know how we got there, but I don't we know. did. Uh, and then we had, uh, and then we were like, "Well, if you're going uphill, you need a power source." So we're like, "Okay, your feet are shotguns now, facing backwards." Right. You're but wearing then, shotgun skis. I started making art for it, and I was like, "This is hard." So I made a, <laughs> a Yeti in a boat instead. Uh, let's see here. So the Yeti is just boating up this mountain as quickly as possible because uh, the the water level is rising. And we just made all this shit up as we're going, right? And the whole point was, as soon as we decided, okay, we're going uphill, uh, Seth and I sat down, we drew on a sheet of paper what the screen looked like, which was just a diagonal line across it. We're like, all right, here we go. <laughs> and I sat down to make the art, and as soon as I hit a point where I said, okay, I can't seem to figure out this whole shotgun foot situation, uh, I just said, hey, I'm gonna make this a boat. And he said, all right. And then we moved on from there. And so the whole point here is that you can retcon anything uh, anything in your games, anything in your, your stories. Oh yeah, Betty evolves once you hit space. Space Betty. UFO <laughs> shoes. Um, um, and some of these things we do for a sort of stretch goal is to figure out, you know, how far we can push ourselves and that sort of thing, which is always really fun. But the whole point being that you can, you can start with something that, uh, that seems like a good idea and do not marry that vision. Whatever that initial vision is, you use it as the seed to get you going and sort of start figuring out what's happening. But the reality is, you are absolutely in the dark about what your game is going to be. And that's usually the case. It's still the case for us. I think there's been like one or two games we've made where we knew what it was right when we had the idea, and then it turned out about what we thought it was going to be. It only happened once out of probably 30 dreams that we've done. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, so the other thing about games like uh, Betty the Yeti is like, so this is a really simple endless run. Um, and that's okay to make some, I mean, you're not, 
you're not reinvent, you don't have to reinvent the wheel or come up with something completely new for uh, for a jam. You just want to push yourself into some kind of territory that you've never been before. The fact is, you know, we have made uh, endless runners before, but all, a lot of the mechanics in this one uh, were new. We, we experimented with coming up with our own collision system to see if we could get that to work. And then as well as all of our endless runners had been in straight lines. And this one was all on an angle, which weirdly complicates the math for a lot of things, right? So in ways that you wouldn't really anticipate. And we had the discussion as soon as we drew that line, Seth was like, this is I was gonna like, be. I, I hate this. I don't, <laughs> I don't wanna do this. And I was like, it's, it's your job. It's your job. Um, and so, so on top of that, when it comes to executing a simpler game like an endless runner, uh, you may find that by the time you get halfway through the jam, you have the game in a state where you're actually pretty, pretty uh, comfortable with it and you feel pretty good about it, which is why in Betty the Yeti, we said, okay, you're boating to the top of Mount Everest to escape the rising oceans of global warming. But we were done with that after the first day. And then we thought, well, what now? We said, what if the oceans just kept rising? Into space. Into space. <laughs> and you, had to, you had to boat to the International Space Station to get up there. Uh, so I updated the code a bunch uh, to allow for sort of swapping the skin of the game. And then Sam created a whole bunch of new art assets. And we added you know, glowing particle trails coming off of Betty and stuff like that. And so, so we kind of got to, by doing a simpler game, we got to really try to nail the initial concept and then do some kind of stretch goals and do some really dumb stuff kind of at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one of the earliest games we made. See, this one's called Chauncey the Rabbit. Uh, how long did this one take to get? Uh, this took two weekends. Exactly. Two weekends. Yeah. Uh, we did, this was available on the App Store, believe it or not, at some point. They had like maybe, <laughs> this, this was sort of our, this was our first actual attempt at a commercial release as well. So, and it did get some downloads. It's about 12, so about 12 uh, yeah. yeah, I think when you win, this huge rabbit comes and his face is a slot machine. And then you get modifiers for your next run. The whole thing's insane. But the whole point being that uh, every game we made has sort of like, at some point taught us something that we then roll forward into some of the next stuff. So when we were working on Better the Eddie, we got to reference like, oh, do you remember that time back in uh, Chauncey we had this enemy that did this, or this particular weird design problem because of the runner aspect of it. Uh, what if we tried this in this particular case? So at this point, I don't know how many game jams we've done, but 30 something. Done but 30 something jams. Do you want to talk about loops? Is that on your list? It is not, list. but let's put it on the list. Right. So go, let's go back to Betty the Yeti, yeah. unless you killed it. I have the power of shift control T. Uh, so, so check out, so on the main menu screen, we've got, we've got a bunch of different things. So normally on a jam game, we put these kinds of things on the main menu. Why? So we don't have to make a new interface for it. Perfect. Uh, we don't want to spend the time on that. So, uh, so these are power loops, which we try to put into every single jam game we make, which is as you play the game, you accumulate points or coins or gems or what, whatever it is. Um, in order to purchase these modifiers to kind of upgrade your character, kind of level up and stuff like that. Uh, this kind of creates that sticky gameplay where after each run, the player is like, you know what, I'm gonna buy, I'm gonna work out my Yeti apps and work on my backflip powers, right? <laughs> and then they can look forward to something that's new or different in the, uh, in the next run. So uh, if you're able to, to do this kind of a thing where, and it's, this is basically just sort of modifiers and numbers, right? So uh, in our case, we tend to just kind of create one sort of singular area in the game where we track all these things in the code. Um, and then all the different aspects of the game, once the game is finished, we go back and we kind of weave these upgrades back into the code and modify all the uh, different aspects of the game. So, so this, this part of the game usually takes maybe an hour or two to get these upgrades kind of laid in there. Um, but it tends to be the thing that gets people to actually keep coming back to your game after they've played it. So some of our games that we've made in 48 hours, people have been able to play for an equivalent amount of time because of the loops. Not because of the gameplay, not because there's like a narrative or open world adventure, but because they're just racking up some numbers and some coins for you know, two days straight of gameplay. Right, so, so uh, one game we made is called Freeway Mutant, which we made in eight hours. Um, and my, so my wife has, has played all the games that we've made. Um, and Freeway Mutant is the only one that we've played for more than, uh, more than probably 10 hours. And she has several hundred hours in Freeway Mutant, even though it only took us eight hours to make. Um, that's it. This is it. So you just run down, uh, run down the road, and you auto your gun auto-fires whenever you're lined up with an enemy. 
And as you progress, uh, the enemies get more health, and so they take a little bit more hits, so they become sort of tougher obstacles to overcome. And you collect these different materials, uh, then eventually you can craft, craft, which is just upgrading your gun to the next level. So that's the whole concept. There's, I think, four different enemies, and then landmines on the ground, and then holes that you can fall into. And that alone can give a, a player, you know, a couple hundred hours of entertainment uh, just because you've got uh, upgrade systems sort of laid into there. Yes, yeah, so that's something we usually uh, we like to do a lot now, but it, it tends to be a stretch goal for people, especially if you're new. It's just hard enough sometimes to just get the damn thing, just get it running. working. <laughs> yeah, uh, and there's always some point where even even now after you know, seven years of doing this, uh, where Seth will hit a bug for like three hours, three or four hours on Saturday, he's just like. Why? And then it's like a semicolon. Oh, yeah, there's a semicolon there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> is that it's always, almost, always yeah. almost every single time? And so meanwhile, I'm like, do it some art. And then I'm like, all right, do we need to cut? Are we cutting something? Do we need to not do this? Should we go work in some marketing stuff? Whatever. Um, yeah, always allocate six hours for semicolon finding just during yeah. the 48 hours. Um, so I think the next thing I want to talk about was uh, food and sleep. Because most people have, a, I think, a very weird idea about how this actually works during a game jam. You are working your ass off for 48 hours in a game jam context. And the reality is if you don't sleep, your work turns to garbage, a steaming pile of it. And if you eat like really weird stuff, you also tend to like not make good things. So uh, where I think a few times in our, our earliest jams, we tried to do the thing where we're like, oh, stay up all night, it's crazy, you know. Get the Red Bulls and Mountain Dew and Cheetos, let's go. Uh, and then you're hung over on like Sunday because of all the junk food and not sleeping, and like you try to put a sleep-deprived programmer on a bug problem, and you're just gonna get more bug problems. Like, that's just how that works. So, uh, really, honestly, like, make sure you set aside eight hours for sleep, or however long you tend to get some sleep, set eight hours, um, and like try not to cut back on that too much, because actually it'll really overall impact how much of the stuff you get done over the weekend. So we tend to get at least eight hours of sleep every night, sometimes nine, depending on if we're feeling you know, loose about everything. Um, and then we just uh, drink coffee. We have usually a Red Bull. That's our sort of extra juice in the afternoon. And then sometimes we'll take a walk, do something like that to kind of go break up the monotony a little bit. Because you are sitting at the computer basically for 40 hours, which is not the best for your body. Yeah, and walks are great. Also, if you're stuck on a problem, just leave. Just leave for mm -hmm. 15 minutes, your brain will figure it out. Yeah. Uh, next thing was tools. So how many people, what are you guys using? Who's using Unity? Yeah. Yep. Game Maker folks, couple guys. Who else? Unreal. What do you guys use? Photoshop drawing. What do you use for the engine yeah. for making the game? Yeah. Uh, game Maker. Game Maker is the one I have experience. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. And then were there any other ones? I missed some. Okay, cool. So we got we got the huge, the usual pile. Uh, luckily, all those are well supported, and there's tons of documentation. So when you run into a weird problem, just Google it. That's the best. Uh, or look it up in the documentation, or uh, because we have the Shannon Jam Discord as well, there's a lot of different devs in there who are working on different levels. Like some of them are doing Pico 8 stuff, everybody's familiar with that, the little micro console. Um, and there's some really weird games that came out last year. So if you're working on one of those, feel free to ask questions to the community. That tends to be a really good way to do it. But I recommend doing it, um, what we refer to as async, which is part of the benefit of having an internet based uh, jam. So just put your question, just put it out there into the jam and say, hey, I got this question about this thing, describe it, and then just leave. You know, like I said, so just go do something else, and then at some point, someone might just like put the answer back in there for you, which is super nice. Um, and if you're using, uh, I guess for art stuff, it's Photoshop, and then who, who else is using what? Who else we got? An Inkscape weirdos? Okay. Blender, probably. <laughs> Inkscape, right, Blender? Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Toon Boom. Toon Boom, okay, cool. Oh yeah, Toon Boom. Does that export PNG strips? Okay, cool. Gotcha. Cool. So yeah, a big part of it is knowing how your tools are going to talk to each other. Uh, so a lot of a lot of first timers they'll be like, oh yeah, I got familiar with Game Maker. I'm like good to go. And then you throw some sprites at them. And they're like, what? How does this <laughs> go in here? There's a bunch of settings you need to make sure you have a toggle and stuff like that. So so make sure you try at least the full pipeline once. So have your artist just make a single drawing. It doesn't have to be anything. It could literally be like, here's a sphere. Export it. Get it in the game. Make sure you know how that whole pipeline works because if you spend you know, an hour or two kind of debugging how that whole thing works right at the beginning because you didn't think about it, uh, that'll eat away quite a bit of time. So one of the tricks that we learned uh, pretty early on for managing art implementation
confusion because if, if your artist is on their on their game, they're going to be pumping out a lot of stuff. Uh, and as a programmer, this can be a little bit overwhelming to manage implementing all the code and then also figuring out what do I like where where do I need to dig into what folders to find the art assets to pull into the game. So uh, we actually went into sort of a folder free mode to manage this kind of a problem where we have a Dropbox uh, folder, all of the assets go into there, and then inside of that folder, we call it working images, uh, meaning these are images that haven't been brought into the game yet. Uh, and then inside of that folder, we have another folder called implemented. So once something gets brought into Game Maker, it just gets dropped into the, moved into the implemented folder, which means that, we, that the uh, folder structure actually becomes a task list for the program. So you just implement stuff and then move it into the implemented. Uh, so you can do these kinds of, of easy process improvements to kind of cut down on miscommunications and keep things from sort of falling through the cracks. Um, so next thing we'll talk about briefly is community participation stuff. So again, there's people in this room, so feel free to introduce yourselves, please, afterward, if there's someone you don't know or someone who looks new, you know, come say hey to them, we'll bring them into the community a little bit. Uh, and then if you're participating on the Discord or on Twitter or whatever else, Again, feel free to occasionally, you know, reach out to people or go hang out in there. It's really fun to kind of get caught up in the general excitement of it. We don't have a physical location. We probably won't ever from Shenanigan because it's just easier to do this way. So, uh, you know, feel free to hop in and get, get involved in a little bit of the hype because it's just a lot of fun. Um, people are generally very, very positive about the fact that everyone's trying their darndest to make something you know, functional and maybe slightly aesthetic over the course of the weekend. So um, just participate and just kind of have a good time. So you might, you might, even if you make something terrible, just post it in there and be like, I made this. And somebody be like, I like the shade of yellow that you did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's a good, good crap. Yeah, so. um, and then the last thing is your upload. So this somehow every every year bites a lot of people, which is they don't think about the fact that you gotta make the game and then you gotta put it, you gotta put it in the pile of games. And the putting it there takes a bit of effort uh, and a bit of, oftentimes consternation because, again, tools are a thing. So uh, for a lot of people, make sure you understand how to turn your game into you know, an EXE, if it's gonna be on, on Windows. Uh, make sure you understand how the pipeline on itch works. We have it explained in there, but we get a lot of questions about it. You'll just upload your game as if you're just putting it up there, and then after it's fully uploaded, then you essentially put it into the jam as sort of like a separate thing. So it's a very simple one too, but a lot of people are like, oh my God, did I, did I miss I missed the bucket? And we had a few of those we had to kind of put in and grandfather in. Uh, last year. You will also be, go ahead. Also make sure that you test your exported game. Yes. Yes. Test yes. your exported game. Yes. <laughs> Shouldn't have to say it, but absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah. At least play through it once. And I'm, sometimes by the end of the weekend, you're like, I, it works. It's fine. I just changed one line. Of it. Well, and, and importantly, uh, clear your save cache for your game's local data of, and then test your execute because that's what your players are going to be working with. They're going to be downloading it and then running with an empty save folder. And your game, this has happened to a lot of people, where your game only works because it was loading something from an old, older version of itself that made it work. Um, and if somebody downloads it fresh, they have no backup data in their save folder, and then the game just crashes on boot up. And then it's... I was going to say also, after you're done testing it and upload it, download it, and then try it again. Because there have been people that have uploaded it, and then it's been interrupted after uploading. So just give yourself some time, you know, finish a little early. Also, yeah, so you can upload at any time, and then you can also just re-upload. So uh, another another option is, you know, if you're near the end, you're like, well, the game's in a pretty good state. we got a few hours left. Let's go ahead and send this off. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll try to do a stretch goal and get something interesting in. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, and we don't have to worry about, you know, not having a play with it. Uh, and the jam does go, it actually goes over 72 hours because it's worldwide. We want to make sure people on the other side of the planet, because we had quite a few of those last year, can actually you know, get more of an equal, equal time and not be uh, sort of starting at 3 a.m. So you can upload all the way until uh, Monday at 8 a.m. So we're probably, we'll, we'll do sort of like a normal 48 hour thing-ish. We'll start on Friday and then we'll just end on Sunday afternoon and then do the kick down event. So uh, feel free to kind of follow whatever schedule you want but uh, you do have to get it in before that upload ends on Monday. So I'd recommend just getting yours finished on, on, on Sunday, maybe even making the first upload on Saturday, just sort of like a dummy folder thing to kind of get everything in place. And that way you don't have to freak out about it when everything's burning down on Sunday, because it's usually what happens. Um, the last thing I want to talk about uh, is post-jam, post-mortems. 
So uh, how many are familiar with postmortem as a concept? Quite a few, most, okay. So brief, a briefer for anybody who's not familiar. Uh, the whole idea of postmortem is that once you do a thing, you afterwards say, why did that go that way? And then you figure it out and then sort of make a list of you know, maybe things you can take with you in the future, tools you can add to your kit uh, so that you can do better next time. So these are some we're very serious about for all of our projects as well as for uh, postmortems and, anything, uh, and jams and anything else. So I highly, highly recommend it because this is also where we've gotten stuff like uh, Seth has slowly over the course of the last five years with every jam added more and more scripts into this sort of general B-Scotch library that we have built. Uh, which allows us now to, when we start a jam project, we start with more of like a template. Uh, we're ready to go. We have like a main menu structure in place. We don't have to worry about that. And there's a bunch of stuff that you can get out of even just asking the question, you know, as a team, what worked well? Like, where did I as a person maybe not do so hot? Did I get like super mad at someone on Saturday because of something weird? Or did we have like a bad brainstorming session? Um, and really work on not just the game side of things, but also sort of yourself in a professional capacity in this particular event. So those are really, really uh, useful and I highly recommend at least taking, you know, even right after the jam, usually we go and get burritos and then we're like, what just happened? Because I've just been doing stuff for two days and I can't, <laughs> I have no idea what's going on. So I highly recommend it, getting dinner with your crew afterward um, or even just yourself and just taking a notebook and figuring out what's going on. Um, so it's basically all we have for you guys. I do want to show you, uh, this is a game that we did not publicly ship this is for the Global Game Jam 2017. We were gonna turn this into its own game, and it's pretty simple. So we were like, we can't show it because maybe someone will take it. Too, super easy to clone this. But who gives a crap? Yeah. So uh, here's Reagan. Zach, we're a bunch of guys shenanigans, and for the Global Game Jam 2017, we made Turbo Max, Regular Fiction, First Edition, three of the sequel. Yeah. It's a fishing game. So let's, uh, let's go fishing. So the one twist is that it's a burning game. Oh my god. You use a fish, you put it on the line, set it up in the sky, and you a fish. Mm -hmm. And uh, the birds come this morning, man, and they uh, get, get come out on your hook. And I'll do a quick time bet to hook them. And then I'll hook them. What'd you get? So the fans got yeah. like a, uh, what are the, what's the blooper? Standard. Standard blooper. I'd say like 27 pounder, probably. Let's see, 27. Let's see, you got a good blooper. Ooh, 43. Oh, that's a good size blooper. Huge blooper. Okay, off. Right. So that's a uh, crystal too. You can put you know additional baits on your hook. Yeah, so crystals. Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 so we get some get some more special. You know, crystals attract. Oh, oh, we got a gold blooper. What happens? We don't know what it's going to be. I right? mean, it's up in the clouds. We can't see it. Here, let's do this. Oh, come on! Let's drag it here. Yeah, I think that's pretty good bicep power. So. Pretty easy to just drag a blooper down to its modern grave. Let's go. All right, so uh, you'll notice we also made a video. So that is one of the requirements for the Shenana Jam, which is sort of different from a lot of the other jams. So rather than make people download, install, and then play through basically 130 games, which is how many we had to come out of the, uh, the jam last year, uh, you're required to submit a just a two minute maximum uh, video of your gameplay. And you can voice over it like we like to do because it's fun to hear someone you know, mashing keys and screaming. Uh, and make sure you know how your tool works. So we suggest using something like XSplit, which is a free thing you can download and then you just record, get an MP4 from it. It literally takes two minutes if, you, if you've already set up. So make sure you set up before because it's, that's sort of the other thing that we get a bunch of questions about usually at the 11th hour when people are trying to submit stuff. It takes two minutes to make the video and then X minutes to upload it to YouTube. Don't so, know? Uh, be prepared. Yeah. <laughs> and then like six hours for them to convert it to YouTube videos. Yes, yes exactly. So, uh, but all you need to get is a link in there. So you're good to go as soon as you get up. Um, so that is sort of all we've got for you guys as far as prepared stuff. Uh, we do have a few more uh, jam games, which I'm just going to turn on the playlist in the background here. Um, so if you guys want to just sort of keep an eye on as we're going, and then otherwise um, just whatever questions you have about any aspect of this, because we also don't know what it's like anymore to be doing this for the first time, or even like the second time, because we've done it too many times, so. Uh, first time, how are those teams formed or decided? So you can either come, just pick a buddy, and come with a team. We usually recommend, I think we said this in the max team size, but uh, we like teams of two to four, sort of as like the general max. Uh, beyond that, it tends to be hard for everybody to actually participate over the course of jam. Um, right. So there's this concept of communication channels where if you have two people, there's one 
channel of communication between them, right? So you're working, they're working. You just go, hey, let's do this, and they go, all right. And then you've had your meeting, right? And it's done. Uh, if you have three people, now two people might talk to each other, and the third person is headphoned up, or they're in a different room, or whatever, and then they don't know what happened. Uh, so now you all of a sudden have to synchronize up, right? You have to sync up with those people. And this gets even more complicated with four, five, six people to the point where once you get into like the five person territory, you need someone who basically whose job it is to manage communication between everybody else and it just gets to be too much. So uh, yes, as few as possible. And then as far as like finding people, either just you, know, you can talk to people physically in this space, which is kind of nice, you'll meet people with your face. Uh, and otherwise uh, we recommend you can either do it as a solo jam if, that's, if you don't want to work with people, or we have a uh, crowd source, uh, it's called CrowdForge. So if you go to the Shenanigans Jam page, there's a little thing, and there's basically people who have put up teams with what their composition is currently, and you can hop into a team. So uh, again, it requires just meeting strangers on the internet via text, so that's kind of an easy one. Um, and that's with the new uh, sort of tool that we found this year for the Jam. So and if you do have any kind of proof of what you're capable of, yes, that's a good time it. to show it. <laughs> it'll, get you, it'll get you onto the team more easily. Which giant muskrat wants to know what are some hard things that you do even as a seasoned game jam team? Hard things to do? Yeah, hard things for you. Gotcha. Uh, as seasoned jammers, <clears throat> what's one of the most difficult things? So, so it, a, a lot of it comes down to genre. Um, the yes. The more action oriented your game is, the easier it is to get it working very quickly. Um, so, something like an endless runner. Uh, something that doesn't have physics, so so a platformer seems very straightforward, uh, right up until you start having moving platforms or pushable blocks or something like that, and then all of a sudden things get weird. Uh, so keep things action oriented if you want an easier time. If you want a harder time, uh, go with something like a strategy game or a simulation game, because in, in those genres, uh, all the pieces have to be in place before the game is fun. And this is also true of games that heavily rely on AI. So we made a game called uh, Do You Even Lift, where you played as an elevator. The thing is, an elevator can't do shit. So <laughs> you just go up and down, and you open and close your doors, uh, which meant the entire gameplay revolved around the AI of the characters that got onto and off of the elevator and how they interacted with each other. And that wasn't actually done until, I think, Sunday at noon. Yeah. And we had to submit by three or something like that. Um, so we didn't actually know what the game's balance was going to be like, how fun it was going to be, whether we had kind of had even a good concept until the very end, because everything has to work before you can experience anything that remotely resembles fun of any kind. And so, on, the, on the art side of things, I haven't had too many problems. I know a lot of artists have more like a perfectionist bent, but we'll just keep on working on the same thing. Uh, I have sort of the opposite approach, where I'm like, this looks barely good enough, I'm going to kick it out the door and move <laughs> on with my life. Uh, and I would really suggest, honestly, adopting more of that sort of strategy for this. Unless it's the case that you have a, you know, like a really, just a really neat animation that you really want to get into the game, you got to recognize that you only have a very brief window of time. And so you're sort of competing with you know, overall depth of maybe one particular character you put in there, as far as how many animation frames it's got, all this other stuff versus the breadth of content that you could slam into this game in a 40 hour window. So uh, as an artist, I think one of, the, one of the things I've seen a bunch and also we've done from time to time is sort of overdoing it in terms of uh, some of the art requirements. So even a game like this, isometric is really, really hard to do, especially when you need to make like 300 different uh, you know, isometric assets for something or even creatures that are supposed to look like they fit. The notice in a game like this, uh, I just didn't because I just billboarded all of the characters and they just kind of look this way a little bit. They are not isometrically drawn in the slightest. And the reason is because as soon as I tried to draw one, aside from the cube, which is a salt lick, and the ground itself, which is just a tile to fit, I did not do anything in isometric. Um, and that's because actually I think the first couple of things I made in an attempt to do isometric, I realized that my brain was just gonna shut down within like an hour and a half or so that I would be a liquid mess for the rest of the game. So, and you can also see the kinds of shortcuts we take here, which is, it's like this character has an eye patch, right? Uh, and we were like, well, if he's gonna look left and right, then we're gonna, Sam's gonna have to redraw him so that the eye patch is on the appropriate side. But not if he has two eye patches. <laughs> <laughs> then you just X flip the sprite and you're good. Uh, and a, and a, lot of, a lot of people will get hung up on, 
uh, making sure that the lighting is correct, that the sprite flips, and, like nobody notices. Just, just go for quantity, you know, in a jam. So, yeah. So any any kind of a game that demands a large volume of content, um, and actually even something like Tau Fight of the Gods was a big stretch for us at the time, because we had eight different uh, or seven different weapons that you could pick up, and then eight different enemies that you would encounter, and so. So Sam had to make a whole bunch of different things, and that was his first, one of his first times doing art for a game at all. Um, and so that as a result, though, none of them were animated. None of them were animated. So the the all the only thing that happens is the projectiles just spun, and their lighting spun with them as they went. No one cares. And then also the enemies just bounced on the ground. That was it. So we squished them. And you so can just 100% get away with that, and it doesn't matter. So if you want to push for breadth, uh, like try doing that because a lot of times in a game jam context, it's more about having more pieces in the game than it is about having like one just beautifully rendered character in a black void of space that has nothing. This is a game jam, not an art gallery. Mm -hmm. right? So, good. Um, do you guys hear we have uh, the software? If you use what app? No, not at all. Yeah, use whatever software you want. Uh, as long as you have a legal right to use it, <laughs> you're good. Yes, of course. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, yeah. so. Uh, as far as like what you bring to the jam, the Shannon jam is very loose in terms of uh, prerequisites. So the whole thing is just start making a game on Friday that adheres to the theme. That's sort of that's the rule. Uh, you can bring we bring our own library to it as far as all the stuff that we built, all the scripts we built. Uh, we don't bring any art typically, but we bring a bunch of sound effects, um, which we've just sort of had these eight bit sound effects laying around for like five years that we just they're just in everything. Yes, yeah, so there's a program easy. called BFXR which we highly recommend for generating 8-bit sound effects. You'll have a much better time if you pre-generate like 40 different sounds and just make a library for yourself. So the way that we did that was they have little buttons you can click. It's like hit or explosion or whatever. And most of them sound like incoherent garbage. Uh, but every now and then you'll get one and you're like, oh, that was vaguely like a thump. <laughs> so, so then you can kind of just pick a name for it. So we have sounds like, you know, sound, Thud hard and then thud wet, even though they, they're basically the same. It's loose, you know. <laughs> but uh, but we, we reuse those sounds in just every jam game we make, and they just get the job done. You know? So you can do that kind of stuff as well. Best. So you, uh, what was what was one of the hardest game jams that you had when you went? Which one did you like? You said the one you were working on and you just got done. With, like, I'll show you this. That was too even left. That was too even left. This one is snuffy wrestling. So this was the one we made for the Shenandoah Jam last year. Um, the thing that was harder than hell about this was that so we decided because we had a we had a larger team and so we had way more art power. And Adam, our uh, our third brother and co-founder, had decided to, to join in and try to make multiplayer thing for us, which we've never actually done at all. And so the problem is the game has to be playable first. Right. And, and then you, and you put multiplayer like in it, right. slash on it. Right. So it's, we didn't know how it was pretty challenging to co-develop multiplayer and the, and the rest of the game at the same time. Technically, it's probably the better way to do it. Uh, but in a jam, you know, you want to get something playable guaranteed and then kind of add on top. Yeah. So it's this weird mix of like a, sort of like an Angry Birds hammer throwing mechanic, try to hit the other player, and then some of these creatures, uh, and then a card game with a lot of sort of chess-like strategy going on. Uh, and we did manage to get it to work. I think, I think, I think four minutes before the deadline for the jam. Yeah. Uh, so that was that was probably the most down to the wire thing we've ever experienced. But that was like the best, you know, burrito eating dinner afterwards. We were like, what did we just do? <laughs> it was wild. Yeah. Um, this, this was also we had uh, we had developed a sort of script library that allowed us to do skeletal animations. In Game Maker, and so this was our first attempt at sort of using that in any kind of a setting. So you kind of see how these characters, their arms are kind of you know floating around and stuff. Um, we do have other things like frame by frame animations mixed in here. So at a certain point, we were like, this is taking too long to animate things. Artists get to work on just frame by frame stuff. So you got to kind of be, you know, be loose with things. Uh, and the important note here is also is as far as like establishing theme and stuff. Just uh, one of the best things I've heard from this is uh, the developers of Owlboy which that game took like eight years to make. It's just absolutely gorgeous uh, pixel art. And he said, at some point, it just becomes interpreting your own abstract art, right? So basically what happens a lot of these games is I'll just start making a thing, 
and then I'll just make the next thing that vaguely fits with that. I didn't, I know, at no point was I like, we're in a blue forest theme with trolls and stuff. Um, I think we started with the troll, and we said, because the theme was slinging the band hammer, so we were like, this is appropriate. So I made troll, and then I made the B thing, platform, whatever that is, and then uh, made some trees, and then we just kind of, you just kind of grow it. And the thing is, as long as the art is consistent, no one will question anything about your universe. So, and also, so the, also retconning is just the name of the game. So, mm -hmm. so this, originally the idea was these trolls were going to be stealing babies. We didn't know why or whose babies, but somewhere these trolls had sort of pens full of babies. And as we kind of worked it, we we're like, that's horrifying. So, <laughs> so we're like, what if they were just some kind of a weird creature? And so we ended up with these snail babies, or snail puppies, uh, which became Snuppies, and then that's where the name Snuppy Rustling came from, because it's like cattle rustling. Right? You're stealing, stealing the Snuppies from the other team. Uh, so the names of the games come out of come out of nowhere. Um, you just kind of keep reinterpreting the weird crap that just ends up in a game. So I think as long as, long as your, your team is the one that makes it over the course of the weekend, it will be consistent with itself. It's almost impossible for it not to be, unless someone's like throwing clip art in there and then like a high-res photo of something and maybe some pixel sprites they stole online. So just try to keep the art consistent and it'll look good and then you can just make up why it looks like that after. Any questions? So besides hard stuff, what's the worst thing that went wrong in one of your games? <sighs> I feel like there's something horrible that happens every time. I don't think, you know? I don't know. So we made a game called Narwhal Online, uh, which was kind of a top-down stabber, I guess? Uh, <laughs> you, so you, you click on the screen and your character sort of shoots across and attacks things on the way. Um, we really like the concept and we had a really good time with it. And Sam ended up creating a whole bunch of really interesting artifacts that the character could pick up that would modify different things about your run. Uh, except, uh, I think it was at 8 o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden the game just kept force closing. So 8 o'clock in the morning on Sunday. And we had this whole list of things that we were going to be adding to the game to finish it. Um, the game just kept force closing, kept force closing, and I couldn't, I thought, is this, a, is this like a, a, a sort of a, a stuck while loop or something, or, or what's going on? There were no error messages, I couldn't diagnose it whatsoever. Uh, and it took six hours, I think, to figure it out. The problem was that uh, when, when these guys got destroyed, they would explode. And exploding basically just spawns an instance of an explosion special effect. And at that time, if you, uh, if you spawn an instance at the same time you changed rooms, the game would just crash. And at 8 o'clock in the morning, I, or around that time, I had changed something where these guys all got destroyed when the room changed, which caused them to explode. Which caused you didn't see it because the room was changing, right? So it looked, it looked exactly as it did before. Everything's fine. And then it took six hours to kind of pin that down, which means we had to cut out that entire last uh, set of features that we wanted to get in. So these things happen. Yeah, I think it's I was okay. just kind of touching up some rocks for that trap time, you know? And I'm just, I'm just shooting bullets. Yeah. So yeah, that's a big part of it too. Is like if you're, especially as uh, the artist, the programmers are usually the people who are stressing out during this time. So uh, don't, don't go, don't go harassing them during the jam. <laughs> like get your stuff in there because usually there's just you know, like excessive. There's gonna be a blood fountain just spraying off their heads. Yeah. So I mean, art is an incredibly challenging thing to do. But on the plus side, you can't destroy the game on accident. Generally, as an artist. Uh, programmers, get. programmers destroy the game <laughs> all the time, and it's terrifying. So, yeah. Yep. Got another question from Twitch. Um, are there any general tips for making good game feel? Mm, general tips for game feel. So, uh, first concept of game feel. So, game feel is just the idea that when you pick up a game and play it, uh, it just feels good. Uh, there's stuff like Screen Shake, which is one of the things we use. We have um, one of the things we found, I think, one of our previous jams was that. For the first time in seven years, we added rotation to the camera vibration. We were like, what? You gotta be real <laughs> careful with that one. It'll make you vomit, it almost yeah. matter, but uh, <laughs> you can do a little bit, like a degree of it, and it adds a nice little jumbly effect to the camera. Uh, so camera work in particular is really important for overall game feel. So uh, shaking the camera when things hit, if you can make it so that they shake more, depending on how close they are to your character, if it's an action game, 
uh, or how close they are to the, cur the cursor or something like that, then you get this nice sort of variant feel. Uh, and then other than that, particle effects, fantastic. Uh, Game Maker comes with just a sort of a bunch of built-in ones you can use, uh, or you just sort of drop, you know, we spray blood or shoot sparks or fire, that sort of thing. Um, there you go. Yeah, also, um, learn how to use the LERP function, linear interpolation. LERP, linear interpolation. Um, it's often just called easing in. Uh, it's, it's, just, it's a simple function that basically says, you know, every frame, say, like let's say you've got an object over here and you want it to move over here. Uh, a lot of times what you'll see for early people's games is they move it in a completely static way where it always moves the same speed. So it'll start going at full speed and then it just stops, right? So this is a very kind of uh, inorganic feel. It almost feels kind of robotic. So if instead you do this linear interpolation where all you say instead is, instead of moving at a certain speed, I'm just gonna close 10% of the gap every frame. And then it kind of does this nice smooth, like, ooh, yeah. And so we do that, that was actually the only easing function we used all the way through after Crashlands um, in every single one of our games. So you can, you can actually do a ton with that. So even when you click on a button, we just, when the button gets clicked, we scale it down, and then we use the lerp concept to just have it nicely kind of come back to normal scale. Um, so just kind of working these kinds of scale, sort of juicy kind of scale movements and stuff to all of your different uh, yeah. mechanics. So we put this in slow-mo, you can see all the stuff that's going on here, right? So we have screen shake happening basically constantly. And my favorite part when talking to other artists is look how not animated that creature is. <laughs> it's, uh, it's just Y scaling on the sine wave. So I didn't do, I just was like, Seth, can you squish this? And he's like, I got you. <laughs> Uh, and that's actually how we do a lot of stuff, because again, we're looking for, for uh, how much how much breadth can we shove into this game in the, over the course of 48 hours. Um, you'll see these numbers slowly fade out, which is a nice effect. Like if your number, if you have on-screen text that's popping up and then just disappearing, it's often very jarring. So again, try to ease things in and out. You'll see this fade coming in and out as the rooms change, which is sort of nicely, again, this helps the player not have this sort of snapped eyes effect. Uh, and then we have shadows and all sorts of other fun. Uh, so notice how this thing scaled up, how it kind of gently comes out. That's that. That's that. And again, when it opened, it actually just scaled down and scaled back up and switched frames. There's no animation of it opening. It just keyframes. That's it. Uh, so this is a really good way. You see this guy? Look, look at all this animation going on. One frame. <laughs> that's it. Just just a little bit of scaling. Um, and if you want to get real crazy, uh, one of the key animation techniques used in games like uh, Binding of Isaac is the simultaneous X and Y scale, where if you scale something down on the X or down on the Y, you scale it up on the X. So it gets this kind of like real squishy kind of kind of feel to it. Um, very, very easy to do if you can just set up a, a simple like one or two scripts that basically just say, I want to squish this thing. And then you just you just sort of get the uh, what the x scale would be or the y scale would be based on how much you've, you've squished it. So another good rule of thumb as an artist is to just ask yourself the question before you work on a piece: uh, Is the player going to notice or care? So again, the shading is upside down on that. Uh, the character x and y flips and actually switches arms. Yep. <laughs> No one has ever said a word about this to anybody on our dev team. Um, and as far as these projectiles go, like they're just spinning, but they're, they're shading the same thing. Uh, most things players will not notice because they're worried about, about the game. And so your job is really to sell the game. It's not about necessarily producing like a ridiculously polished piece of phlegm that flies across the screen 60 frames per second, right? Uh, most people don't care unless you're working at like a AAA studio doing some like you know, deflating bags of rice situation in Far Cry or something, you just don't need to worry about most of those things. Any other questions? Uh, I see like a bunch of drops. <laughs> you just draw one and you can do like just... That is correct. I drew a single rock. Well, not, not yeah. really. No, no, no. It's uh, one. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So there's particles, yeah. So you draw, just draw one? Uh, usually I drop, you know, I take a little liberty to do two. <laughs> <laughs> usually one that's teardrop shaped and one that's just a ball for liquids. And then for rocks, you just like kind of jagged, you know, shape, throw one shade on it, and then you're done. And you can make two of those. It takes like three minutes. And then you ship them off to your program and you say, make these explode out of there. So, 
Um, and yeah, those are really simple things to do that once you understand kind of how the pipeline works for getting those assets in, uh, you can put, you can juice up anything in your game. So stuff like clicking a button, um, where, like I was saying, you can ease it and then you can even shoot blood off of it if you want, you know, and all sorts of crazy stuff. Yeah, so the, the golden rule is that, you know, anything that a player can interact with should give some kind of direct feedback. So uh, preferably both auditory and visual feedback. So if you click on a button, it shouldn't just all of a sudden you're now in the next room or whatever. It, the button should kind of squish in or pop or change color, um, and it should make a clicking noise or a beeping noise or whatever so that the player knows that that thing uh, is what is doing what they think it's doing. So, you push back in? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add to uh, what level of experience you need to partake in You need literally zero experience, but a lot of heart. <laughs> Some people don't have a lot of heart, so I think that's the whole trick. Because uh, we, so this is this is actually how we got started making games. It was just by making really hideous and horrible things in like a two-day window. And the nice thing about it is, like, once it's over, you can be like, "Well, I'm glad that was." You just bury it. Uh, yeah, you take just, it out back. <laughs> just, just don't worry about we it. We actually we actually have a folder um, with I think. So we we don't only do these jams sort of uh, with community-oriented events and stuff. We also uh, do internal jams. Um, we, there was a time where we would do them on a weekly basis. At one time we did uh, five jams in five days. Um, and so we have this folder that's just, it's just a graveyard of unbelievably terrible games. Um, I think we have about 140 dead projects in there. You know? uh, so that's okay. You know, the whole point is to just push yourself in some domain and just try to learn something new. So. Have you ever tried to go back to the jam game besides Yes. So actually, most of our commercial games have come out of jams. So 100% yes. Uh, actually, let's see if we can find the quadruplets video. Uh, as as about so long. Also, Snuffies is one of the games, too. I yep. can't show you that yet. So this game we made in seven days for uh, what's called the Seven Day Roguelike Challenge. So make a, make a roguelike game, which is just one where you die permanently when you die, <laughs> and then the game restarts. Uh, this was what the game looked like after seven days. And then we spent another, I think, three months on it. Um, and we launched it, ended up getting about 2 million users on Google Play and iOS. It's about two months of work, two or three months more of, of work on the project. Um, and this is definitely how we usually end up finding our, our sort of next project, is through doing this jam. So, uh, we like Snuffy Rustling is one of the one of the games that's in the back of our of our, our catalog right now. Like we've been working on that one. We just had a discussion about it today, this morning, about one of the design problems we have with it. Uh, and currently, we're working on something else, but it's sort of it's just been percolating back there. And we worked on it for six months before we put it aside. So we had the Shan Jam in May of last year. We worked on that game basically all the way up until Christmas, and then we turned over and worked on another game since they were sort of trying to get it this year. So yeah, all the time. Another Twitch. What was the most recent thing you learned from a game? Most recent thing you learned from a jam? I guess our most recent one was Snuffies, wasn't it? Yep. Oh, did we do it for the Global Game Jam? No. We just sure. showed up for that. That was you know, the first times. So we were in the middle of some other stuff. Right. Uh, yeah, so let's see. Well, the most recent things we learned from a jam. Well, that was the first time. So when we made uh, Snuffy Rustling, it's the first time we had made a sort of turn based. Uh, competitive strategy game. Uh, Would not time, recommend it for a 48-hour game jam. Yeah, first, time we had, <laughs> first time we had done anything resembling sort of like a card battling or, or deck building sort of a mm -hmm. thing. Um, it was the first time we had done uh, multiplayer, and it was the first time we had had a team larger than four. Uh, so the list of things that we learned is pretty extensive. Um, I think one of the best things that we probably did was we developed the game in the multiplayer completely independently. And uh, our web developer, Adam, he was just working on sort of creating an API that the game could talk to. So then regularly throughout development, um, as we reached milestones with the gameplay, we would talk to him and say, okay, here's how the game is working now. So this is the kind of data that we're gonna need to be sending from player to player. Um, and he also implemented a dead simple match matchmaking system, which is basically one person joins and they wait, and then the next person who clicks the button gets matched to that person, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you can do these kinds of uh, simple tricks to kind of make a multiplayer game. 
So we learned how to do all that kind of stuff by, by putting ourselves in a position where we had to solve those problems because we had never done any of those things before. Um, are we uh, able to uh, continue to use the uh, Microsoft Office for the Yep. Yeah. So, the question is, uh, are you able to continue communicating on the on the Discord server once the jam's over? Right. Um, so yes, absolutely. We actually just turn it into the game dev channel. So it's usually it's usually the game dev channel that we switch over to the channel. I think we added it this year as a separate channel. So uh, there's a group of people who've just been still in there since last year, uh, just kind of working on their stuff or or just kind of chatting stuff. So it tends to be a really good place to kind of hang out and, and especially if you continue working on the same game, uh, get some feedback from. Them. Uh, is it good. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so post GIFs, post videos, whatever you want. Uh, post playables, if you want some feedback. Um, they're usually game jams, you don't have time for any feedback, so there, there's something else. Um, and then on, on that note, as far as like community interaction goes, once the jam is done, we actually have a, a rating period. So there's also one of the differences between our jam and, and most of the other ones online. Uh, the community gets to vote and rate games. So uh, you'll be competing against like 130 other ones, but uh, we then go and we play the top 10 games that uh, the community picked during that jam that year. So they put them up on our YouTube channel, and it's just kind of a fun way to, again, for us to have like a little bit of a dialogue with the broader community of making games, um, and also for people to get some eyeballs on their work. And we had some really fun and weird, wacky stuff. There was some weird stuff. From that. There's like a dabbing fight game. Yeah, just dabbing people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I made one where the kid's thumb gets like six times larger than his body. Yeah, the there, was a, there was a Pico 8 game where you're cutting fungus off of a foot. Oh. It was just the grossest thing I've probably ever seen. <laughs> but and then some of those, I mean, we, we looked through all, we watched the whole, because all those YouTubes we just put in a, or all the YouTube videos we just put in a playlist. So you can sit there for like, basically take like an hour, hour and a half actually at the end of the jam and you just sort of like hang out and watch. It was more than that, we had 130 games last time. Two minutes so each. Yeah, yeah so it was, it's, like a, it's like an afternoon, right? So make some popcorn. And yeah, just watch all the crazy <laughs> stuff. And then like if you see something that you like from someone, you know, go and just leave a comment. You don't have to play it necessarily, but leave a comment on your thing or, or go check it out and, and give a rating afterwards. So it can have a really nice community vibe, but that's, it's 100% like how much you want to be involved versus like you get, you get as much out as you put in, right? That's for the, yeah. And I know the rating concept is maybe a little intimidating to some folks who have done either haven't done a jam uh, or who have only done jams just kind of for, for fun. Uh, so the way we kind of think about this is it's kind of like running a mile, you know, which is nobody cares how fast you can run the mile. Uh, it's just a form of feedback on just kind of how you're doing, right? And so, uh, so by getting feedback from everybody else about your game, then if you come back next year, and participate again, then you can kind of see how you've improved in different areas by what kinds of responses you get from people. So it's more about sort of metering your own progress and improvement over time, more so than just, because nobody's static, right? As long as you keep working on stuff, you'll keep improving. And so it's okay if you get low scores in some stuff, uh, that's just feedback on what you can work on and improve on, right? So, uh, yep. Yeah. Now you talked about using Dropbox file sharing. What about for the entire project? Uh, we've tried that in the past. Uh, we end up using Bitbucket. You may also use something like GitHub or something like that. Um, if you're if you're doing any kind of repository work, where you're like saving into Dropbox or pulling down from Dropbox with a game maker project, a Unity project, or something like that, you may run into syncing issues because the projects tend to be made of a huge volume of files, and if one or two of them gets out of sync when you switch computers or if you, you know, maybe your laptop flies into a river and you gotta run over a micro center and buy a new one real quick and then get back to work. Um, and you have some missing files all of a sudden and now your, your project is corrupted. Um, so when we were really early on uh, in our studio, we did lose some smaller projects to that kind of an issue. Awesome to fire. Yeah, uh, they're just gone, they're just destroyed, you know. So, uh, yeah, so stuff like uh, Bitbucket or GitHub, where you're actually committing everything at once and then pushing it up, um, is a much safer route. So, yeah. Do you have any tips for people who are going solo, other than the uh, Yeah, <laughs> if you're going solo, uh, keep it simple. So keep it real simple. There's a there's a game jam called Ludum Dare or Jar, yeah, all right, Jare, Jare, whatever, tomato, tomato, whatever it is. Um, which is a solo game making competition. So if you want some inspiration on sort of like what kinds of things are possible for a solo person to do, 
just go over there to the competition section of the Ludum Dare website and, and see what kind of things people have made. Um, I'd also recommend, so for example, if, if art isn't your strong suit, then focus on things like uh, shape and color palettes. Um, so, so we actually taught a course, a uh, game of course at Wash U, uh, I guess a year ago or something like that. And one of the requirements we had on our students when they made their first game was they were not allowed to use art at all. And they instead had to use only shape and color to kind of convey what was happening in the game. Because then you learned about things like, hey, round things tend to be good and pointy things tend to be bad, right? And green things tend to be nice while red things tend to be bad in some way. And so you can communicate a lot just by using shapes and color, which then allows you to focus on the mechanical aspects of your game. And actually, there was this one guy with Global Game Jams who made an RPG purely out of squares. That was hilarious. And he was just narrating it. He's like, so this is a wizard, and it's just, it's just like a blue square. <laughs> I think it was one of the best demos I've ever seen. Great. And everybody was laughing, you know, and it was great. The gameplay was great. Um, the story was really goofy. Because uh, it's easy to do a story because you just put text on the screen, right? And as long as you tell somebody that this square is a wizard, they're like, yeah, that's a so wizard. That, yeah. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Consistency is key. Yeah. Anybody Final else? questions. Any advice for people working with an international team? Working international. Uh, figure out the sleep situation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, One of you is going to have to sync up, probably. Because like, work, working asynchronously is just a... It's just a nightmare. Yeah. Um, so you're going to have to figure out when you're going to be working all at the same time and try to maximize that sort of together time. Um, otherwise, you're going to have a you have a rough a rough jam. Yeah, because invariably we'll have a lot of stuff with. Uh, I mean, we'll talk about oh we want this enemy in the game that does this particular thing. I'll go make it. I'll give it to Seth, and then he's like, well this doesn't quite work based on all this other crap that's now in the game that I put in. But I can just you know, put an explosion on it, and it's good to go. So like we do a lot of sort of duct tape work around each other's uh, sort of async problems and that sort of thing. So be open, like make sure your team's ready for like, I know you wanted this, but this is what happened because we're working asynchronously. <laughs> so just don't worry about it. Yeah. I also suggest making a list on like Trello or something like that, so you have things that if you, something isn't working and you just need to work on something else, you have a list already. We actually used uh, we used, just used a Google Doc for all of our sort of project management in the early days because um, when we had just two people, you know, you can both see what's in the, in the document and it doesn't take very much work. Um, also, conveniently, a Google Doc becomes patch notes over time, so that's nice. So, uh, all right, so I think that's all the time we have, right? Uh, so thank you all very much. I think we'll be just chilling just for just a little, little bit. bit. Uh, so if anybody has any other questions that you were too nervous to ask because they're very serious questions. Yeah, I do just want to say, like, if this is your first time potentially jamming, um, first time you know picking up Game Maker or Unity or something like that, uh, like, please absolutely just approach it with sort of that that childlike experience of just saying, you know, you're you're here to sort of color vaguely inside the lines. That's sort of that's the only just requirement. Get that crayon. Just start. <laughs> just going all over this thing. Um, the the worst thing you can do is be too scared to actually participate. And really put yourself in it. So just try to put yourself out there, uh, make art, make a game, make some music, and make something weird for this weekend. And you may not even finish. This does happen. Totally fine. You know? uh, people people get sort of bite off more than they can chew, or they hit a weird bug that breaks everything at the last minute, and you may not even get a game submitted. Uh, that's fine. You'll still learn a ton, and you can. I mean, that doesn't mean that you can't still finish off the game and then you know just show it to people, uh, send it to people in the Discord channel or, or whatever. Um, that's still fine, and it'll still make the experience completely worth it, so don't even worry about it. Cool. Well, thanks a bunch, and I guess we'll see you over the weekend on the internet. That's right. <laughs> <laughs>